We are going to be back in the book of Haggai this morning, and we are there for some specific reasons because of um, where we are as God's children in this world right now, and where we are as God's church in our life growth and uh, ministry to our community right now. And I don't know, you probably have had this experience, I hope you've had this experience at some point in time, but... I don't know if there's anything more encouraging as a human in relationship to another human as to when you are dealing with something, uh, whether it's work-related or family-related or just uh, personal, and it's something going on inside of you. And you go to a friend and you say, you're not going to believe what I'm dealing with. And you just pour it out before them. And that friend responds and says to you, I know exactly how you feel. I know exactly what you're going through. Uh, I've been there before or I'm there right now. And, and I just want you to know that, you know, you're not alone and, and you are going to get through this. And isn't that a great feeling? Isn't that a great encouragement? Well, I have good news for us as Grace Baptist Church this morning, we're gonna we're gonna find a friend in Haggai um, this morning. We're gonna go to Haggai, and if you know if it comes up this week that somebody asks you um, who's been a good friend to you later lately, just tell them Haggai, and that may start a conversation that they didn't expect and you didn't either. So, um, but uh, it's it, um, it's gonna be uh, a good one, I believe, especially if it's along the lines of what God is teaching us in this in this series, in this book, um, in this prophecy from Haggai. So we have been talking about how God has given us some cornerstones to build upon um, in this book. We'll get to those in just a second. Before we do, we're going to read through the, the verses in Haggai that we've already seen. Again, the theme of this series is confidence in Christ, our confidence in Christ individually and as a church to um, to build and rebuild what God wants to do for his glory. And so again in Haggai 1, verse 1, it says, In the second year of King Darius, in the sixth month, on the first day of the month, the word of the Lord came by Haggai, so he was a prophet, the prophet to Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, saying, so here's the prophecy, Thus speaks the Lord of hosts, saying, This people says, The time has not come, the time the Lord's house should be built. So um, that was the first prophecy that um, Haggai gave. <coughs> Haggai is only two chapters long, but it's four sermons. That was the whole sermon. And I know what you're thinking, why can't we have sermons like that? Um, but that are that short to the, to the point. <laughs> Just kidding. Um, but uh, they, um, the point that he was making is, is that a general thought had come among, uh, come across the people in their thoughts and minds. It had become popular to think and to say, mm, "We came here to with the in, the the, in, the intended purpose." Of rebuilding the temple of God and, and um, restoring a place that we could worship His glory, but it's just not time yet. It just doesn't feel right. It just doesn't feel like the right time yet. And it had become popular among them. To, they so they discouraged one another from doing what God had sent them there to do. And sometimes friends can do that as well. Um, so the second prophecy comes in verse three. And following, so then, then the word of the Lord came by Haggai the prophet, saying, "It is time for you yourselves to dwell in. Is it time for you yourselves to dwell in your paneled houses in this temple to lie in ruins? In other words, you guys came here to build uh, the temple, the place where uh, the dwelling place of God, the place where people know and worship and experience the glory of God, the place that is the way for people to God. You came here to do that. You got distracted." by your own ideas and ways, even by your own houses. And so he says to them, 
Um, now, in verse 5, Now for this says the Lord of hosts, Consider your ways. You have sown much and bring in little. You eat but do not have enough. You drink but you are not filled with drink. And you clothe yourselves but no one is warm. And he who earns wages, earns wages to put it into a bag with holes. Remember we talked about how all that was God not allowing them to be satisfied or to have enough um, by their own doing and their doing according to their own will. Verse 7, he says again, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Consider your ways. Go up to the mountains and bring wood and build the temple, that I may take pleasure in it and be glorified, says the Lord. You looked for much, but indeed it came to little. And when you brought it home, I blew it away. Why, says the Lord of hosts? Because of my house that is in ruins, while well, every one of you runs to his own house. Therefore the heavens above you withhold the dew, and the earth withholds its fruit. For I call for a drought in the land, and the mountains, on the grain, and the new wine, and the oil. On whatever the ground brings forth, on men and livestock, and on all the labor of your hands. Then Zerubbabel the son of Shealtiel, and Joshua the son of Jehoshaphat the high priest, with all the remnant of the with all the remnant of the people, obeyed the voice of the Lord their God, and the words of Haggai the prophet, as the Lord their God has sent him, and the people feared the presence of the Lord. Then Haggai the Lord's messenger spoke the Lord's message to the people, saying, "I am with you," says the Lord. So we have stopped there uh, last week. And I, we actually had four rock-solid reasons to act confidently in Christ as a church, but I added another one this week because um, I like to do that. I like When I see more things, I like to point them out. So, um, so we talked about God's promise, and we went all the way back to Deuteronomy for that before the people even entered the promised land. And we talked about how God had promised to bless them in, in obeying him and following him, and he, he promised to... Um, relinquish that blessing if um, they chose to follow their own way and follow the ways of Satan, really. We talked about God's plan, and God's plan was for them at that point in the promised land to take over the promised land, but then um, later on it was for, for through David and then to Solomon um, for David to envision and Solomon to build a temple that would be the dwelling place, the, the permanent dwelling place of God, like the tabernacle had been the dwelling place of God as they moved about um, through the wilderness and in their conquering. Now they would have a temple that would be the, the permanent place of God's presence and worship and where people came to know and experience his glory. And then we talked about God's provision last week. So... God made a way after this temple, the, the first temple was built by Solomon, and it was, it was splendiferous. Um, it was really something to behold. And it got destroyed because the people turned their backs on God. God sent the Babylonians to take them into captivity. When they took Jerusalem, they destroyed the temple. But God's provision was such that after they had been in captivity for nearly 70 years, um, that he made, he put it upon the heart of, of the rulers in charge that had, taken, that had conquered the, the Babylonians to send them back and rebuild the temple of the one true God. So they went back to do that. And God provided for them, as we talked about last week, all the camels and donkeys and horses and people and, and a ton and a half or uh, half a ton of plus of gold. They had everything they needed to do this. They had money, they had provisions, they were, they were set to do what, what God had called them to do. There was one problem. They didn't do it. So they had all these things and they, they just, they did not do what God wanted to. So then we get to God's prerogative. And God's prerogative shows up in some of the verses that we just read. Um, verse 9, for instance, you looked for much, but indeed it came to little. And when you brought it home, I blew it away. Why, says the Lord, Lord of hosts, why are you lacking all these things currently? Why is your food not satisfied and your money's not enough and your clothing doesn't keep you warm? And then he tells us at the end of verse 9, because of my house that is in ruins, while every one of you runs to his own house. 
They got distracted. And God's prerogative was to kindly <laughs> chastise them and get regain their attention and focus upon him. Does God still do that for us? Yes, he does. Because um, as a father disciplines his children, so God chastises those he loves. And that's what he did for his people here. And so they, his, his prerogative comes into play because you look at it and say, oh, God can't do that. God wouldn't do that. Well, sure he would if, if he loves us. And what do we just sing about before this message? How deep the Father's love for us. And so he puts them in a position where now <laughs> they are in really good shape to listen to God and depend upon God. You hear what I'm saying? They're in really good shape to listen to God and depend upon God. Have you ever been there? Have you ever been, just wonder why in the world nothing seems to work and everything is going to stink? And you realize, hey, wait a minute. I'm in a really good spot to listen to God and depend on him because everything else that I would depend on all the other sources that I would um, you know hear from and start are, are falling short or falling apart and that happens to us as people it happens to us as God's people it happens to us as a church and I think what God is trying to communicate to us is that uh, through Haggai, I think Haggai is saying, or God is saying through Haggai, I understand where you are. And to, a, to an extent, he's saying to us, I kind of put you there so you could listen, so you could depend, so you could obey. And so he goes on to, to say, Verse 10, therefore the heavens above you withhold the dew and the earth withholds its fruit. For I called it, I called it for a drought on the land and the mountains, on the grain and the new wine and the oil, on the, whatever the ground brings forth, on men and livestock and on all the labor of your hands. And then the people did what? Well, they, they responded in dependence and obedience and they did the, um, they started the work of the Lord. So that get, takes us through God's um, prerogative. But what we're going to focus on this morning is God's perspective. Because when we go to our friend, um, we go to our friend, and our friend is truly our Heavenly Father. And we say to him, this is what I'm going through. And he says, I understand. What's even better than just him understanding is him giving us, giving us his perspective on it. So that's what we're going to see. So would you pray with me real quickly as we get into this next portion and we ask God to give us his perspective on what's going on with Haggai and his folks and what's going on with us and our folks. Lord, we thank you that you care enough about us to, um, to enact your prerogative in, in our lives and, and um, definitely bring us to a place repeatedly where we can depend and or we can listen in obedience and I pray that you would help us not um, pass by those opportunities and those times um, focusing on ourselves and our sorrow but instead um, being blessed to humble ourselves before you and worship and depend upon you help us to do that each one of us wherever we are in life right now help us to do that as your church where you know we are right now and I pray that you would help us to do that uh, as we gain your perspective on things in the truth from your word that we're going to hear right now um, thank you God help us I pray in Jesus name amen so we get in so we again we have God's promise, God's plan, God's provision, God's prerogative, and now we're going to talk about God's perspective. And so we're going to go back back to Haggai chapter one, the last two verses of chapter one, 
And it says this, So the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and the spirit of Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and the spirit of all the remnant of the people. And they came and worked in the house of the Lord of hosts, their God. On the 24th day of the sixth month in the second year of King Darius. All right, so what I'm going to do this morning um, is I'm going to, you're going to play Grace Baptist Church, and I'm going to play Haggai, okay? So, or I'm going to give you the God's perspective like, like Haggai it would. Um, and what I'm going to do is give you some um, perspectives on where the people were during Haggai's time, the rebuilding of this temple. And where we are now is God's church building and rebuilding uh, his work for his glory, okay? So the first likeness that we get to is this. Some of the people, oh, so excuse me, all the people were excited about a new start. Everybody was excited. So look at this. It says, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel. He's the, he's the, the, the leader, the um he is the uh, political leader. Um, and then the uh, son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and the spirit of Joshua, he is the spiritual leader. Okay, so Joshua, the son of Jehoshadak, the high priest, and the spirit of all the remnant of the people. Everybody got excited. That never happens. You could have a group of, of Lord bless them, Dallas Cowboy fans. Hmm. You can have them there to pray for them because they because they obviously need prayer, and you could you could say to them, "This guys, I got good news for you. Um, Dak Prescott is coming with um, a, uh, one of those limousine vans, and he's going to drive you all up to watch the Cowboys destroy the Washington Football Team." And you're going to get to sit in luxury boxes, and you're going to eat free food, and all none of this is going to cost you anything. And somebody in that group would go, well, and they would have something that some reason they didn't didn't like that. You know what I'm saying? I'm just using that because it's football season. But in in a group that you you could offer the what you would assume they would all want, and somebody would say that's not exactly what I want though. But here, in this group, when you're talking about thousands of people, they all got stirred up, but they all got excited for the same thing, which was rebuilding God's temple. And again, the, it's remember what God says about them here. It, it is thousands of people, but they are, in fact, the remnant. You know what a remnant is? It's who remains. It's who remains. They are the ones who remain to the people of God that came back to um, the city of God to rebuild the temple of God. And so they are, it's a big group, but in comparison to all the people that once were there, they're a small group. But they're all excited about the same thing. Now last week, um, I talked to you for a pretty good while about um, the need for our uh, trust in God's provision and our response to that being our part participation in God's work as the people did when in, in the book of Ezra when they got all those provisions and they marched back to Jerusalem to build, rebuild the temple. And I was so blessed this week when, okay, so it's like, I, I'm trying to remember how it went, but um, I was teaching and Lisa texted me and said, hey, because uh, she was working from home and, and said that Fred had just called and one Fred Weymouth from the Fixed Ministry and wanted to know if we could do, um, if we could cover the, um, the feeding the homeless today. So it's like four days in advance and I'm like, whew. Um, and I was like, yeah, I was like, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll just... So we can do, you know, of course, for Grace Baptist time, Grace Baptist Church, four days is a long time. You know, it's, it's a lot of, that's a lot of head, 
um, heroin, so or leeway. So anyway, but when she sent messages out to all of you, I, I was very blessed by the response and the and the the the, um, the positive response and the and the desire for participation, even though it was such short notice. And then um, mercifully, it actually was uh, next Sunday, so we did have a little breathing room. Um, but I'm saying that to encourage you because it's okay um, to be excited about being part of what God is doing. It's a good thing. It doesn't mean you always have to be excited in order to be part of what God is doing. Because sometimes, you you know, the excitement can ebb and flow depending on a lot of different factors. But I want you to know it's okay to be excited. Don't be afraid of being excited about what God is doing. Sometimes we can be like, I just don't know. What if something goes wrong? What if it doesn't turn out like I hope it will? It's okay. Just be excited about what God is doing and, and know that whatever God does with it is is worth being a part of and is eternally worthwhile. And it's for his glory and your joy will come as a result of that. Be excited about what God is doing. And the the remnant of the people were excited and that was great and good. And I want you to be excited about the new way and ways in which God is leading us to um, reach out and to be the light that he desired for us to be, to be, you know, the temple um, was no longer the dwelling place of God or the place where people, I should put it this way, the temple was no longer the place where people came to know God once God came here, Jesus Christ. He came and said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And scripture refers to the church and um, individuals as the temple of the Holy Spirit, the body of Christ. So um, I'm not telling you that, please don't get this wrong, that this that we're something to be worshipped, but I'm telling you we are the vessels that take people to people the knowledge of God so that they may know him so that they may come into contact with the truth about God that points them to the glory of God and our relationship with him forever I hope that really really means something to you because um that's what we are. And I know for a fact that as Christians, even Christian leaders and as um, churches, it is so easy to get distracted from that best thing by a whole lot of good th other good things. But that best thing of being God's vessels, the vessels of God's glory and power and truth, to those around us and those in our community is, is, is priority one. Making disciples. And we, it's okay to be excited about that. Would you agree? It's okay to be excited, but we should be excited about that. We should be refocused on that. We should be re-engaged with that. We should be excited about that direction, whether it's a redirection, a um, fresh direction, or whatever you want to call it, knowing that we're, we are being what God saved us to be and doing what God commanded us to do. And that by his power, instruction, and even by putting us in a place where we could listen to him and depend upon him and follow him. So some, or the, the, the remnant were excited about a, uh, a new start, a new rebuilding. And then we get to um, chapter two. So this, the, make note here, Verse 15, it ends by saying, on the, this is all happening on the 24th day of the sixth month in the second year of King Darius, okay? 
Let's go to chapter 2. In the seventh month, on the 21st day of the month, the word of the Lord came by Haggai the prophet, saying, so four weeks have gone by, basically, okay? From the 24th day of the sixth month to the 21st day of the seventh month. You with me? So they went from what would be our June 24th to our July 21st, okay? But it's, it's different for them. But their calendar is different, but this just giving you an idea how it would work for us. And um, they are in the right at the end of the celebration of what was called the Feast of Tabernacles or the Feast of um, Booths. And that feast was to celebrate God's provision for them while they were in the wilderness uh, wandering for 40 years before they entered the Promised Land. And they were wandering in the wilderness for 40 years because of their, their, their lack of dependence, their disobedience, their uh, lack of trust in God. But even so, he provided for them. Do you all remember how he provided for them? Manna from heaven. Water from rocks. Quails they could catch. I don't know if you've ever been quail hunting, but I, it's not that easy to shoot a quail. Catching them with your hands is, I mean, that has to be a guy thing. And they must have been pretty fat and slow, which means they were tasty. So God provided for them during that time. And they're celebrating that. Keep this in mind, please. This is the backdrop of Haggai's message. They are coming out of the feast celebrating God's provision. And this is the message that Haggai gives them. Verse 2, speak now to Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and to the remnant of the people, saying, Who is left among you who saw this temple in its former glory? And how do you see it now? In comparison with it, is this not in your eyes as nothing? So the second likeness that we see here is this those who there was there were people among the remnant who had been in Jerusalem when Solomon's temple was there. So they must have been young. Let's say they were let's say they were ten to fifteen years old, okay? When Babylon came and took people captive and took them off to Babylon, they survived there. They they, they lived their 50, 60, 70 year, years there. And came back as part of the remnant. And they were part of the excited bunch about rebuilding the temple. But what's happened? What do you figure they got accomplished in a month's time of, of building that temple? All they probably got done was the... This is just a, a guess. But it was... We'll say, we'll say it was the... Um, the footing, okay? They they at least got started where they knew they saw they could see the footprint of the old temple and they could see the structure of the new one going up. And guess what? The, the structure of the new one didn't even come close to filling the footprint left by the old where the old one was torn down. And so those who had seen the temple in its former glory went from being excited about what they were going to be a part of to mourning the fact that it wasn't like it used to be. That's the second likeness I picked up on in this way. Because it's a temptation for me, for any of you all that have been here for some time to think, um, you know, I wish that it was thus and so because we're, the reality is it's hard to... Um, build to a temple when the footprint of another temple that seems in human terms better is right there staring you in the face. And so the only thing we can do about that is to have the right perspective about it and say, okay, what is truly going on here? And what's truly going on is what God reveals to them in just a few minutes, but I, I want to just remind you that 
our perspective about things, our human perspective can be vastly affected by the world's perspective. God's perspective is never affected by the world's perspective. He doesn't, he is not concerned with um, the, the dressings of things or the number of things or the amount of things. He doesn't need those things to accomplish his work. He, he owns them all. We'll talk about that in a moment. Let's see what God says next quickly. He says, so he says to Zerubbabel, God says, the prophet says, God says to the prophet to Zerubbabel, yet now be strong, Zerubbabel, says the Lord, and be strong, Joshua, son of Jehoshaphat, the high priest, and be strong, all you people of the land, says the Lord, and work, for I am with you, says the Lord of hosts. They were having a hard time keeping, continuing the work because it was hard work. It was probably harder than they thought, slower than they thought. And then again, like I told you, it was not going to be as glorious as the temple was, humanly speaking, before this one. Solomon's temple was something to behold. People came from foreign lands to behold it. It was, it was gigantic and it was ornate. This one was not going to be nearly as gigantic or quite as ornate. But that wasn't the point. The point was the presence of God was going to dwell there. That's, what, that's why they're doing it, but they lost sight of that. They lost sight of the fact that it was the way and the place where people will come to know and worship their God and enjoy his glory. We can't lose sight of that. When we do, we need to be reminded of that. That what we are doing as Grace Baptist Church is being used by God to provide, to show, that, to give them the way in which they can know and enjoy the glory of God. And that is Jesus Christ. It doesn't matter if we're in a nice building or um, under a wobbly tent, Martin, uh, <laughs> like the um, last farmer's market. It was exciting because our tent was broken and the wind was really blowing. Um, so, um, but um, it doesn't matter. What matters is where our hearts are and where our perspective is and who's in charge of that. And that's what, why God was giving them this encouragement here. Work, I'm with you, says the Lord. Keep doing what God has called you to do because I'm with you. It's the right thing. He would not have encouraged them to keep doing what they were doing if it was the wrong thing. If God had come along and said, hey guys, you know what? Let's just wait. This is, this is not looking good. Your temple looks like junk first of all God wouldn't do that second of all they probably would have, they probably would have gone <sighs> and given up but that's not what he says he comes along and says you're doing the right thing keep doing it I'm with you and so he goes in to verse 5 and says according to the word that I covenanted with you when you came out of Egypt so my spirit remains among you do not fear for this says the Lord of hosts, once more is a little while, I will shake heaven and earth, the sea and dry land, and I will shake all nations, and they shall come to the desire of all nations, and I will fill this temple with glory, says the Lord of hosts. The silver is mine, and the gold is mine, says the Lord of hosts. The glory of this latter temple shall be greater than the former, says the Lord of hosts, and in this place I will give peace, says the Lord of hosts. Now there's a lot tied up in that prophecy, a lot of it has to do with um, the future with when Christ returns, but there's enough, there's enough of it that applies to then and now for us to find a couple more likenesses. One in particular that um, I'm going to focus on. Verse eight says this. Seems kind of random. The silver is mine and the gold is mine, says the Lord. Says the Lord of Hosts. Why do you think God said that to them? 
Why do you think he would, in the middle of this profound prophetic speech, say to them, the silver is mine and the gold is mine? He's in charge of everything. It all, like I said a moment ago, it belongs to them. To, it all belongs to him. But here's another reason particular to their situation. Remember how we talked about last week? They came with all this, all these people and supplies and resources and gold. Well, it's all gone. It's all gone. We just read about in chapter one that they can't, they can't get enough food. They, can't, they don't have enough clothing. They don't, you know, so on and so forth. They've exhausted all of their resources. And at that point, they're probably looking around saying, we can't, we can't afford to build the temple as nice as Solomon is. We can't afford to, to um, you know, be uh, a church like so-and-so. We can't, we can't even do the things that we're trying to do right now. We don't have the money for it. And God gets right in their face and says, the silver and gold is mine. What is he saying to them? I've got everything you need. I will provide. And his presence with them was reassured. His provision for them was reassured. He had proven it to them. Now he was reassuring them of it. And we have every reason to take to heart that perspective from God for ourselves. You can probably listen to some of these things and, and recognize how they indeed apply to us that we're excited about the direction God's taking us, but there's some um, shadow or of the former things in our purview that we are lacking the silver and gold that we think might be necessary to do these things. But I hope you hear from God his perspective on all of that. I'm with you. He says it um, in a couple different ways. I am with you. Do the work. I am with you. And secondly, I've got everything you need. The silver and gold are mine. And that's his message to us um, this morning and in this season. I'm with you. Keep doing the work. Keep doing the work because I'm with you and I have everything you need. Keep doing the work because I'm with you and I have everything you need. So I'm saying to you this morning, Grace Baptist Church, keep doing the work. God is with us. He has everything we need. Let me pray for you. God, we thank you for giving us the promises that you have and the provision that you hold and um, doing everything necessary to help us believe in that and, and, and trust in that. And I pray that you would help us to recognize that um, it's that our perspectives are affected by a lot of different things. Um, but yours is only affected by uh, the, your truth and, and your power. Um, so I pray that our perspective will be affected by your truth and your power as well. And um, that you would help us to uh, hope in you and trust in you and um, follow you. Um, and I pray that you would deliver us from all the things that affect our perspective. Um, and help us not to act on those things even though that we might think we're seeing them or, or we might think about them or feel them. I pray that you would just help us to act upon what um, we know is true about your commandments, about your mission, about your promises, and about your um, provision to make it possible um, for us to follow you and do your work. We ask these things in Jesus' name for your glory. Amen. The praise is going to come up and sing. Uh, we're going to close by singing.
you are God alone. And I just want you to remember, uh, as we sing that, that, that He is that is who we are trusting in.